I just wanted to ask, um, with regards to most of the, not to say that there aren't environmental problems in the UK or North America, but most of the problems are going on in the global south. And while I've been born in the UK, I don't really see myself, even though I'm an ethnic minority, I don't see myself as someone from the global south. Th those people in the global south, the Indians and Africans, are the, those are the people in the thick of it. So how would you suggest to actually... And it's not for the want of pride, not for the lack of trying from this organisation or other ones that do environmental conferences, but how, how do those people who are not coming to these conferences, uh, the ethnic minorities, how do they actually come here, and how do you actually get them from I don't know where, wherever it is that the, these places are going, the temples or other places, and actually saying, look, this is a part, this was a part of your culture, um, this was a part of whether it's religious or not. Um, why should it matter whether you go to a temple or not? This could be a something which is resembling a temple. But um, how, how do you get those people to come here and um, you know represent and actually tell us the stories that they're actually um, experiencing in the South because they're probably born there and actually give us a different perspective because I feel that um, it's, it's very much in silos when we're in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and we, we don't really get a reflection of what is going on in, in, in these countries where most of the population is. Thank you. Well, thank you for giving voice to that. That was, yeah, thank you very much. And um, the thing that came through to me then and, and my own experience in, in this whole area is that something in order something has to make sense to something, someone. You know, it has to be meaningful to someone and they have to feel um, comfortable in order to take something new on board. So mostly, it's about taking... Like people have discussed, haven't they? It's about going to people in the... The right people going to the people in the places they're at and making these things meaningful to them in languages that actually make... Because that is so key to change. This is a particular form of, you know, that's been created, you know, that lots of people wouldn't identify with, um, that people don't come to. And it's like, how do you then, in understanding, for me, understanding a little bit more of how we operate, um, you invariably go back to going to people where they are in comfortable ways and talking to them in, in, about things that are relevant to them is really important. I mean, that's... And maybe over time, then, these, these events start to shift because those links start to be made. We only ever make really incremental changes, often, anyway. Yeah, just to, just to add to that, I would say, um, in terms of going to people where they are, like, organising approaches, um, I facilitated a conference recently um, with a speaker, Aaron, from Hope Not Hate, who was organising in... I don't know, I can't remember where uh, they were organising, but um, Dudley, organising in Dudley. And rather than doing going into communities and doing like uh, specifically anti-racist work, they were, they're going and organising with communities, but in an, but in an anti-racist way. So they're basically going and listening to communities about the challenges that they're facing and then working on addressing them collectively with them in a way that is not racist, in a way that is not kind of othering and blaming other communities, because there's loads of initiatives that are basically doing that, and that's really kind of driving the problem. So I would say, you know, in the environmental movement, like, organise with communities, but in an environmental way, and get them to be kind of thinking about what matters to them and bringing their experience. Um, and yeah, I've been really pleased with Organising for Change that we've managed to get a lot of diversity because we've offered free grassroots spaces and we've tried to really spread the word. And so it hasn't just been all of the usual suspects getting together in a room. And, you know, we have managed to have like trainings where, um, you know, there are actually half the people are people of colour rather than it just being a bunch of white people that work at NGOs. Um, but I think there's a lot of work needed to, to be done there. Just to be a devil's advocate as well, a little bit, you know, if people are directly affected and surviving, you know, really just surviving, it's quite difficult to say you're getting the brunt brute of this 
structure and system that's causing this suffering can you also fix it because it's about you and we want you to be heard and coming from an area where people are being faced with austerity stuff they're knackered so actually it's more stressful going do you want to can you please come to this event in another part of the city that you've never been to that you feel people would judge you and can you tell us about your experience directly because it's really shameful for people to say I'm one of those people that's struggling, that's been on the dole, that you might have this issue with. So I think it's also saying, let's tell communities, you know, this is what we're doing in this part of the world or the community to try and support you. And we just wanted to say we're with you in your suffering and we're doing this over here. It's not perfect, but we're going to try. And also be aware that we're all tribal. To force people into your group to look more diverse is not helpful. We all, you know, feel safer in different areas. I work with lots of white middle-class women because craft can attract them in. And they're like Women's Institute. I target Women's Institute because politically they're really influential. And in terms of politics in the UK and in terms of corporate campaigning, to get people who aren't directly affected by injustice to say, I really care about this issue, scares the shit out of them because they go, why the hell do you care? The fact that you care makes me think maybe this is a bigger issue that more people feel connected to rather than it just be people on the ground going, I'm directly affected and I want you to fix it. So sometimes it's good to be in safe spaces that can be silos, but also make sure that you're aware of all of the other, you're mindful of your bias and you're aware of other people with our stitching, we often have stories of people from the global south to meditate on and put yourself in their shoes. So not victimise or, or say that they're amazing because we're all flawed human beings, but saying, where are we part of the solution here? Where are they part of the solution there? Because if we try and do everything and make this a multicoloured rainbow, it's going to take us decades to get there, if ever at all, and then we'll get nothing done because we go, it's not perfect. So I think some silos are good. Sometimes let peop people just survive and say that you're going to support them, um, but always be mindful of what you said, of the flaws, but also don't make it force you to be paralysed to say this isn't perfect, so there's no point doing anything. There's time for one more. Um, oh my god, my voice. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for what you shared, because as a person of colour myself, obviously, I um, just always find it very valuable when I hear something along the lines of what you said. Um, what My question is, it comes, uh, I'm asking this question after hearing R Rachel, what Rachel spoke about, but the answer can come from anywhere. Um, you spoke about intuition, and we had a wonderful array of range of words or synonyms with, for intuition. Um, for me, <clears throat> something I connect with personally is subconscious wisdom. Now, in my, I can only speak for myself, obviously, but in times where I felt anxi anxiety or depression, it's usually been in hindsight, because I have not felt comfortable or brave enough to accept subconscious wisdom. It's the wisdom that my subconscious or my heart or my gut is telling, giving me is something that I consciously am very uncomfortable dealing with. Now, because, and now, what I struggle, what I'm at this moment in my life, I'm at university about to finish, and I have a lot of anxiety, obviously, about the world outside. But what I'm worried, what I don't understand is when, so I'm, I'm, I've developed quite a good habit of like um, watching myself and my, like the ego and everything. And if I'm rejecting some kind of wisdom, I'm like, why, why is it? Why do I want to stay in this kind of comfort zone? Why am I scared? And, but what I don't know is whether this subconscious wisdom that I might be aware of, even if not com consciously, that doesn't make sense. If the subconscious wisdom that I have, I am aware exists within me, and I'm, my heart is trying to tell tell me of it, how do I know whether that's coming from my own 
ego, if that makes sense? How do I know if I'm, any, any wisdom, any intuition is more coming from what I want to know or what I want to feel? Or Does that make any sense? And, and I read an incredible, beautiful book called The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck. Um, and he suggested that the only way to find out is through debate. So think about it, question it, ponder over it, and figure out whether that intuition, that wisdom is truly independent from your sense of self and your ego, or is if it's something you are trying to, you know, you, do you know what I mean? But, now this is my question. <laughs> finally, finally I've got to my question. Thank you, sorry about this. Um, you know when like your whole life, you're trying to condense it into one <laughs> sentence and it's quite hard. Um, my question is, I don't know if overthinking is the answer. So how do you know <laughs> when to just go with it, go with the intuition or think about the intuition? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for that. And also for what maybe what you've experienced as well is sometimes you're like talking it through. You kind of, yeah, you finally go, all right, yeah, this is what it is, isn't it? It's kind of, this is, this is where it is now. And, um, you know, yeah, I'm like, I haven't got an answer, but what, arises for me when you say that is you said you know overthinking it you said to me but then there's this and it, you're kind of here and what my experience is that we have not normalized inquiring into this we've over normalized the, ana the analysis so this is actually a very important part of this and we tend to separate them even in our conversations today we've tended to separate them and so what you don't really tend to find is a conversation where I say, where is that felt sense? You know, where is it? You know, where are we going to give space to that felt sense that you've got there? And, uh, and this isn't therapy. This is like, this is giving that attention to the felt sense that you're currently, that we all tend to just give to the thought. We overvalue the thoughts. We don't give that space and we don't normalise between us the inquiry into the felt sense, which is that wisdom. It's just not in our spaces. You know, it's seen as some, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm in therapy now, and it? It's like, you know, this is not good. I'm, I'm broken because I'm suddenly looking at my felt sense. So is that helpful? It's like you, we need some space that's inquiring, being with that felt sense, kind of like just allowing it the space that then you find the answers arise in different ways. And, and, and the knowledge arises. The knowledge has got space to arise from that felt sense, and you start to see the underlying... Um, thoughts, beliefs that are there. Yeah, I mean, that definitely helps, especially what you said about normalizing. We, we've normalized analysis. I'll leave it there because I know I've spoken a lot, but thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. Did you want to say I think, I think a lot, I mean, I'm, I'm sure lots of people in the room, I love a good self-help book, you know, the highbrow ones, you know, learn about the psychology of stuff. But I also am aware that because nothing's perfect, you could just be like, where's this from? I want to name it and claim it. And sometimes we need to, that just makes us go in a downward spiral. So into yourself, you're just paralyzed a bit. So I think it's that balance as well of going, where can I learn more about myself and how my brain works and my body works? But also, where can I be of use in this world that might not be perfect, but I'll have a go and see where it works. And it takes off a lot of stress from going, I need to know everything about me before I can go into the world. Because most of the time we learn through doing as well. And then we go, oh, did that wrong, but I'll learn from it and try something else. So I think also as well as you're never going to know fully, but you learn through doing, you have a balance of, I'm going to do stuff, I'm going to reflect on it, I'm going to be aware of the baggage I'm bringing into stuff. In all my workshops, I have a lavender smell to calm people down, but as soon as people pick up a pen or a needle and thread, they can tell and I can tell where they're at at that time. Are they anxious? Are they angry? Are they ready to say this isn't going to work, or are they open-minded? And by doing stuff, you're aware of all of those emotions and being in a safe space to ask, what is the baggage or the presumption I'm bringing to this? Or what is my feeling of hopelessness? Or is it that I can fix this on my own? And I think that learning through doing and that constant cycle is much better than just being like, I need to figure out everything and then go do it. Otherwise, you're just going to drive yourself insane and you're going to be burnt out, which is ironic, isn't it? 